Praise the Lord and welcome to our last class on a study of the book of Romans. Uh, today is our last class and we'll study uh, Romans chapter 16. Uh, we began studying Romans chapter 16 uh, on Monday. We just read through the chapter and uh, we looked at, you know, what really impresses us in this chapter here is about Paul, you know, talking about or listing the names of various people and, uh, you know, greeting them. So just looking at uh, how Paul uh, co-works, co-laborers along with others uh, and has got the right mindset about uh, kingdom work, kingdom building. Kingdom building is all about, uh, you know, uh, co-laboring, co-partnering, with others in building the kingdom of um, God. So we saw how he, you know, takes the pains to really mention each one of them by name because it was not easy in those days to write. So they just didn't have paper and pen available or just type it out like we have a computer or uh, a, a mobile and, you know, uh, just uh, quickly type out all the names. Um, but it was, you know, painstaking. It had, they had to take the effort to write but in spite of all that he makes takes the time and the effort to ensure that uh, you know uh, he mentions the names of the people that he wants to um, greet okay so we look at um, uh, further um, in our study about Romans chapter 16 before we look further into our study of uh, Romans chapter 16 let's pause for a word of prayer Can I ask uh, uh, Zelotoli to lead us in prayer please Let's pray. Father, we come before your presence in the mighty name of Jesus. Father God, as we begin the last class for the book of Romans, we thank you for each one of us. Lord, you bless each one of us also and give us your wisdom and insight as our pastor Selena teaches uh, uh, us today. Lord, give her grace, give her your uh, wisdom to teach. Lord, we thank you, we bless you, we honor you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Zelatoli. So here, um, Paul, uh, in verses 1 to verse uh, 16 of Romans chapter 16, he is uh, mentioning all of the people that he likes to greet. Uh, he is mentioning them name by name. And he is also, you know, acknowledging what they are doing for the uh, Lord. So something that we can learn from Paul is that uh, uh, ministry work or kingdom building is all about uh, working together in partnership, co-laboring, uh, partnering with others. It's not about just, uh, you know, uh, taking hold of uh, the vision God has given you, the calling, the function, the purpose that he has called us to. Yes, it's taking hold of that, but it's taking hold of that together with others and working along with others um, uh, because, you know, we are part of one kingdom, okay? Uh, what happens if we are just thinking about or just focus about our ministry, our church? What do you think is our mindset? What do you think is our mindset? If you're just thinking about our ministry, our church, what do you think is our mindset? Sorry? <laughs> Okay, uh, Jeffina says that's not even our mindset, okay? But what if you're just thinking about, okay, this is my church, I need to just build my church, this is my organization that God has given to me and I just need to build it, then uh, what? what is our mindset? Or, uh, yeah. Self-centered and not uh, Christ-minded. Okay, we're self-centered. It's like, you know, we're building our business, our kingdom, and we are not building the kingdom of uh, God. So kingdom of God is basically what? When you talk about the kingdom of God, uh, what is the culture in the kingdom of God? Okay, we are all one. What is the culture of the mindset when we think about kingdom of God? Or what should be our attitude, our mindset when we think about in kingdom building terms, kingdom of God terms? We are one body, 
in Christ? Yes, we are one body in Christ, even though we are different parts with different functions, we are one body in Christ and we have one head, okay? And so even though we have different, we're different parts and we have different functions, uh, we all need to come together to work together for the perfect functioning of the uh, body of Christ. Okay, so just thinking about our own human body, you know, all of us have different parts in the human body. Each part has different functions. And what if the fun the body parts say, hey, I don't want to work alongside with others, that we totally dysfunctioning in our uh, body. Okay, so same way, uh, when we think about the kingdom of God, it's so important for us to co-work, co-labor, co-partner uh, with each um, other. And... Um, uh, and even as we are uh, going about fulfilling our own ministry, our calling, our function, uh, we learned in the kingdom of God and kingdom building uh, the course that you studied on that God sends people into our vision, right? God sends people into our field. God sends people into our ministry. Um, and he sends them for a season uh, sometimes for a longer season. And uh, why does God send people into our field or to our ministry or into our vision? Why do, he why do you think he sends them into our calling, the vision, the ministry that he has given to us? To work with? To work with together, yes. Why does God send other people into our visions and our field and our ministry or into our labor? Uh, I think it's not our vision, it's God's vision. <laughs> so, okay. he, uh, so basically we, he have, we are working towards one, one kingdom. So he, he sends people so that we could help each other, so that we could work uh, united because it's always better as two. <laughs> yes, two are better than one. And we complement each other. And God has uh, designed us in such a way that we need each other uh, to work alongside each other because we don't have the skills and the capabilities to do everything. We need other people's help, uh, their skills, their abilities. Also, sometimes God sends people into our labor for them, for us to mentor them. Like uh, Paul, you know, he had Timothy, he had Titus, he had Onesimus, the runaway slave, and he had so many other people whom he uh, mentored and he, you know, raised up uh, uh, from being sons to being co-laborers, co-partners, fellow workers along with him in uh, the body of uh, Christ. Okay, so look at how uh, in this chapter, just in verses 1 to uh, 15, uh, look at how Paul, uh, you know, greets these people. And he just doesn't say, okay, greet Priscilla and Aquila, uh, uh, comma, greet uh, uh, Junia, greet uh, Andronicius, greet Urbanus, uh, Herodian. He doesn't just mention them by name, but he actually says something about them, right? Uh, look at how he calls uh, each one of them. What? How does he refer to them or call them? In verses 1 to 16, you can look at your uh, Bibles. How does he refer or call to uh, call out each of these people after he mentions them by name? What does he say about them? Fellow workers, okay. How does he refer or call them? Um, he says, uh, who labored much for us. Who labored much for us, yes. The first fruit of Acacia to Christ, when he says, Ephen, Ephenitus, I think so. Yeah. Ephenitus, yes. He also says, my beloved, right? Uh, look at verse 5, says, my beloved. Verse 7, he says, fellow prisoners. That's not mean that they are in prison with him, but since he was in house arrest, you know, uh, people could come and meet him 
uh, and fellowship with him and those who are serving him, helping him, doing the ministry along with him. Look at what he says in verse 8. He says, my beloved in the Lord. Verse 9, a fellow workers in Christ. Verse 10, approved in Christ. Verse 12, he says, who have labored in the Lord. So he just does not, uh, you know, for just mention them by name, but you know, uh, he he says something uh, nice about each one of them. So I think even when we um, have people in our team, you know, um, calling out, calling them out by name and thanking them uh, encourages them, but also you know, just appreciating them a simple way for what they have done, um, you know, really encourages them, really strengthens them, really brings about that team joy, that oneness, that unity. Uh, and when people feel recognized, feel accepted, you know, they're, they're willing, they're, they're able to, uh, you know, uh, work joyfully and, uh, you know, um, uh, go the extra mile to do things uh, for the uh, ministry. Okay, so we see what he says in verse 11, uh, one, sorry, verse 1, he talks about Phoebe. Uh, Phoebe is a deacon, uh, and Chincheria is a small um, uh, town near Corinth, and she's traveling to Rome, and Paul knows about it. So he's telling the church at Rome, uh, when, you know, Phoebe uh, comes, you know, please um, be of help to her, help her out. Paul also mentions Aquila and Priscilla, uh, who worked with Paul uh, at Corinth. Now, when there was a persecution at Rome, you know, the, the, the Christians had to leave from uh, Rome. So Aquila and Priscilla came to Corinth and, you know, they uh, they were with, uh, with Paul because they also had the same business like Paul. So I think they would have met and knew each other. And um, also we, uh, Paul thanks them. You know, he says, uh, uh, he says that, you know, uh, Greet Aquila and Priscilla, verse four, uh, 3, verse 4, he says, who lives their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also to the churches uh, of the uh, Gentiles. So we uh, see in, um, you know, uh, we read in Acts chapter 18 that when Paul was in Corinth, you know, uh, both Aquila and Priscilla and Paul were tent makers and, uh, you know, they, they stayed together, they worked together uh, because they, just, they were the same uh, trade. And in Acts chapter 18, verse 12 to 17, we read that the Jews in Corinth brought Paul to court and they were accusing him of violating the Jewish law. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, the program council at that time, Galileo, he dismissed the case. And it is suggested that, you know, Aquila and Priscilla played a role in supporting Paul uh, during this challenging situation, uh, possibly even risking their own safety by standing up for uh, him. So Paul is, uh, you know, making note of that. He's basically uh, thanking them uh, for what uh, they have uh, done and how they risk their own lives for uh, his life. And he just gives thanks to uh, them. And then he's he goes on to, you know, uh, mention other names, acknowledging what they are uh, doing uh, for the Lord. And um, so we learn that we need to also acknowledge, thank people for the work they're doing um, and the sacrifices they make for the Lord. Okay. Verse 7, he mentions about Junia, who is a lady, and, uh, you know, he's uh, he's making a note of her here, and he's saying that, you know, uh, she's somebody who's uh, uh, remarkable, outstanding, uh, uh, and Junia is one of the apostles, so it could uh, imply that she's a female apostle. This could be a possibility, but uh, he's just stating, you know, uh, what a remarkable and outstanding uh, lady apostle that uh, she is. Okay, um, and he also mentions of churches who meet in houses. So in those days, they did not have their own church buildings, but they met at the homes of uh, different people. And that is why, you know, Paul is mentioning all of them uh, by name. Okay, uh, we'll move on to verses um, 17 to 20. So can one of you please read verses 17 to 20, please?
Can one of you please read Romans chapter 16, verses 17 to 20? Now I urge you, brethren, not those who cause division and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you learn and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all, therefore I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. Um, still verse 20. Okay. And the God of peace will crush us uh, as uh, 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 be with you. Amen. Okay, uh, I think we couldn't hear you in the last verse, Elatoli, but uh, we'll read that last verse. Uh, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Thank you, Zelotoli, for reading those verses. Now, in uh, verse 17, we see uh, Paul's heart once again. Uh, his desire is for believers to live in unity and in oneness and so he says you know watch out for those who are causing divisions and bringing offenses which are contrary to what has been taught to them from the word of God or what has been taught to them from the life and the ministry of Jesus and so he says if people are speaking things that are different and causing others to stumble and fall in their faith and this is causing division, uh, causing offenses. He says, you know, from such people, keep away. Avoid such people who are divisive and offensive. Just stay away from them. He says, don't partner with them. You know, and he says, these people are actually doing all of this, not because they are believing in some truth, which they are zealous and passionate for, and they want the truth to be known, but actually they are doing this to serve their own selfish interests. It's for their own selfish interests. It's not just some truth that they are so profoundly impacted with that they want others to know, but he's saying, hey, their agenda, their plan, what they're doing this is totally very selfish, uh, of selfish interests um, and very self-motivated of the flesh. And so he's saying, don't have anything to do with uh, them because they are not serving uh, Jesus. And uh, they are deceiving people you know, these uh, uh, people who are bringing about division, they are deceiving people who are simple. You know, the you know, he talks about those who are weak in their faith, those who are babes, those who are, you know, uh, new in their faith, those who are, you know, maybe have been in, in the faith in a few months, but they are, uh, you know, uh, growing in their faith. He's saying, you know, these simple people who believe everything that they hear, you know, uh, these uh, 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 decisive people or these people who are causing division, uh, you know, they take advantage of such simple ones and they speak to them and they lead them um, astray. So Paul is saying, you know, avoid such people and it's important for believers to stay together in unity and oneness. And he says, be wise in what is good and know what to avoid and what to pursue. Okay. So do we have people in our churches who bring about division? Yes, no. People who cause division, people who cause other people to go away from the faith, lead, taking them and leading them to, you know, others who talk about other doctrines in a very different way. Do we have people like that in our churches? Yes, we do have, right? So I think it's important for us to stay away from such people, avoid such people, you know, uh, and it's important uh, for us to teach that's why it's so important for us to teach the word of god so that when the word of god the truth of god's word is taught people will know what is right and what is wrong and they'll be able to judge it for them uh, selves okay so it's important for believers to stay together and he says be wise in what is good okay and know what to avoid and what to uh, pursue so we need the wisdom of god 
Okay, sometimes even we, after studying in Bible college and you know the Word of God, we can le easily be led astray by some false doctrines, some false teachings. But it's important for us also to be grounded in the truth, to uh, know the truth. Uh, to that's why it's important, so important for us to read God's words, so that when we have a fresh new revelation that comes up from any part of the world, any part of our city, and people get excited about it, it's important for us to go back to God's word and know what God's word is teaching us about that so that we can encounter that and know whether it's the truth, whether we need to receive that revelation uh, or we need to uh, leave it out. Okay, So we need to be wise in what is good and know what to avoid and what to pursue. Verse 19, he says, um, he says, for your obedience has become known to all, therefore I'm glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. So he says, your obedience has become known to all. This means that when it comes to, you know, all of these people who are deceiving others, causing division, um, you know, uh, he says that it isn't that the Romans must, you know, correct a bad situation, but, you know, it means that when he, comes to dividers and deceivers, uh, you know, it isn't that, that the Romans must correct a bad situation, but they're already dealing with these situations well. Uh, they are handling these situations well. And Paul is glad that, you know, they are taking the necessary steps to, you know, encounter or, uh, you know, to stop these people who are bringing in uh, division or deceiving other people. But he's saying yet, you know, continue to remain diligent against the attacks of these dividers and these uh, deceivers. And so he says, be wise in what is good, which means, you know, this is the best defense against those who are causing division, those who are deceivers. Uh, and he says, it's far more of use to know the good than it is to know the evil, to learn about the genuine than what is the counterfeit. Okay. So even as, uh, uh, you know, even in our present church, in our present day situations, there are many false teachings, false doctrines that people are listening to different other speakers, preachers uh, during the week. And, um, you know, they're asking you as a pastor or as a life group leader or as a Bible, uh, somebody who hosts a Bible study in your house or a prayer group, they're asking you, hey, did you listen to this? Did you listen to that? You know, what about this? What about this? You know, so um, what uh, it's important for us not to, you know, actually uh, uh, highlight the false teachings that are going around uh, because that will cause interest for those who haven't heard it or listened to it. And if they're not strong in their faith, they can be easily led away. But what is important for us to do as leaders is to listen to all of these false teachers, to go back to the word of God, to know what's the truth and teach your people, you know, uh, the uh, teach your uh, sheep what uh, is the truth from God's word. So when they encounter these uh, false teachings and false doctrines, they're able to replace it with the truth that you have taught them from God's word. And they can go back uh, to God's word. And God's word is powerful. It's a double-edged sword. It, you know, it, can, it, it teaches, it corrects, it trains in righteousness and holiness. So God's word will do its work. So what you need to do is don't advertise unnecessarily about these false teachings and false doctrines. You know, just... Um, Teach the truth and the truth will set people free and will help them to know what is good and what is counterfeit and, um, you know, follow the uh, truth. Okay. And he says, don't get involved with evil, but just stay away. That means um, Paul, you know, even when he's writing to Timothy, he says, don't waste your time in, you know, arguing with these people. There's a lot of false teachers that, uh, especially the Jews who are becoming, you know, uh, believers coming to the church, they're bringing so many doctrines, you know, uh, fables and myths of Old Testament stories and do this and do that. And so Paul is saying, hey, don't argue with them. Don't fight it out with them because it's it's basically useless because, you know, words is, uh, uh, is basically not going to get you anywhere. It's going to cause more strife, more division, more disunity, you know, uh, basically teach the truth of 
uh, 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 of God's word. Teach the doctrine. He tells him, just teach the doctrine. Stay on that. You know, uh, teach the word of God, and that will help um, uh, people. Because uh, you know, uh, these false teachers and false doctrines are, you know, basically these people are teaching it out of their own selfish interest. So they're not going to listen to you. And it's also the evil one that is working in them. So you just can't fight against that. Just leave it. You know, do your work. Stay your course. Teach the word. Okay. So um, verse 20, he says, and even as you do this, you know, I mean, as you don't you stay away from uh, deceivers, those who are bringing in division, even as you stay away from them, he says, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Okay. So Paul is basically saying that any church with, uh, you know, the well-deserved reputation, like the church at Rome, the house churches at Rome, you know, who always stay on their guard against both, uh, you know, those who are dividing the church and deceivers, you know, they will see God crush Satan under their feet. Okay. So even as you are pastoring a church or you're teaching, whether it is uh, youth you have uh, you know that you are mentoring ministering to or your children's church pastor or a, or a youth leader or a, you run a bible study or a prayer group you know even as you teach people the truth from god's word you know and you keep that unity and oneness you're doing what it requires for you to do you know what god requires for you to do uh, you know god of peace will crush satan under your feet and it says here that, you know, um, uh, uh, when we go about doing this, believers will, what does it mean? Uh, that the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. It means uh, you as believers will walk in dominion, okay? And you will walk uh, in experiential uh, 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 walk of triumph. There will be victory. You will experience that victory. You will experience triumph over uh, Satan and God will cause you to walk in triumph over what Satan is doing. Okay, it's interesting that this word shortly. Did you ever? I mean, when you read this verse, did you ever think what the shortly means? You know, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Any thoughts on what it means? What does shortly mean? Okay, shortly means, you know, uh, it implies a sense of imminence or swiftness, okay? Imminence, nearness, quick, fast, okay? Swiftness in God's action. Uh, it does not necessarily mean that it's immediate in the sense of happening instantly, uh, but rather emphasizes that it will occur, you know, without unnecessary delay, or it will occur in God's appointed time. When God thinks it's the right Kairos moment, it will happen. Okay, So that is what it means that God of peace will crush Satan shortly or under your feet shortly. Okay, And then he goes on to say, now to him who is able, okay, um, so uh, who is able to establish you. So Paul knew that the, the church uh, at Rome is facing a lot of... Uh, dangers um, um, and Paul fittingly you know he just concludes by commending them to the one who is able who is able to establish them who is able to strengthen them who is able to encourage them and Paul knows that this will be done according to uh, he says my gospel and the preaching of Jesus uh, Christ okay so even as you go about doing ministry and fulfilling God's call over your life, you know, there can be times when we can be discouraged, disheartened, uh, you know, lose hope. We want to just leave and, you know, run away, uh, you know, but we uh, need to know that the one who has called us is faithful, is able to do it. He is able to establish you, strengthen you, help you, uh, you know, continue to help you run with endurance and uh, perseverance. So it's important to look up to God and not look to man. I was just, um, you know, uh, in my Bible, in my own personal time yesterday, I was just reading and this phrase just hit me in this book that I was reading. You know, when um, 
when our eyes are focused on man rather than God, you know, there is more anxiety, there is more fear, there is more oppression and there's more depression. Okay. And I thought that was so true. You know, when we're looking up to man and we're looking uh, for man to help us or to recognize us and, you know, to appreciate us and all of those things, if you're not looking up to God, you know, then there is more anxiety, there is more worry, there's more stress, there is uh, more depression. But when we look up to God, you know, uh, he gives us the strength, he aids us, he encourages us and the peace of God, you know, takes control and the joy of the Lord is our strength. Okay, so it's important for us to know, you know, the one who is able to establish us. It's not our strength, it's not our calling, it's not our gifting. It's the one who's called us, who's able to establish us and help us to finish what he has entrusted to uh, us. And Paul says, you know, uh, also knows that this will be done according to my gospel. And he says the preaching of Jesus uh, Christ. Okay. So my gospel is the gospel that he was basically preaching, the gospel that was kept as a secret and uh, is now unveiled. This is the gospel that he is preaching. So in verse 26, Paul says, the gospel is being made manifest by the prophetic scripture and is made known to all nations. Okay. So uh, the gospel was in the prophetic scripture, the prophets revealed to it, revealed about it, is written, you know, it is there in the prophetic scripture, it's hidden there, which means people did not know it, but now it is unveiled. How is it unveiled? Who unveiled it for us? Yes, the person and work of Jesus Christ and uh, and all of these apostles and people like Paul who encountered and um, uh, encounter Jesus, you know, they are proclaiming this gospel. So he says, according to the revelation of the mystery, which Paul means this, that, you know, as the whole plan of redemption, you know, God had this whole plan of redemption and he planned it uh, to be uh, brought about through Jesus Christ. And even though God announced this plan much ahead in time, you know, very in the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, 4,000 years before Jesus even came, you know, but it was, um, uh, uh, and he also revealed it through various prophecies. The final outcoming or the final outworking of this plan was evident or, uh, or made known. The mystery was revealed to us by God through his son, Jesus Christ. Okay. And then Paul says to God, uh, alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ for ever okay so in this conclusion Paul is basically reflecting on the wisdom of God's plan uh, in how he brought about redemption salvation the gospel and the fact that such wisdom is way beyond man's comprehension or understanding okay so God had a plan that no one else, no one else could plan or come up with such a plan, but it's the wisdom of God and uh, uh, God's wisdom and glory is very evident in the way that he redeemed uh, mankind. Okay. So if there's anything in that the book of Roman explains from beginning to end, it's basically the greatness of God, his infinite wisdom, the way he goes about, you know, uh, Paul talks about God's plan, how he is, you know, revealed to us in the Old Testament and how he is bringing about those plans and purposes. So it just talks about the greatness of God's plan, his, vis uh, his uh, wisdom and uh, how he uh, initiates that, how he brings it about, you know, uh, and how he is glorified even as he reveals and brings about his uh, plan and he says paul says this is the gospel that i am preaching this is the good news that i am uh, preaching um so it is fitting that paul you know basically concludes this letter praising god uh, for such a glorious gospel such a wonderful gospel a plan of redemption uh, through which the wisdom and the glory of god is seen okay um and the good news that paul preached is, uh, you know, he just presents the God who chooses to glorify himself uh, through the person and work of Jesus Christ and uh, who will glorify himself that way for 
ever. Amen. Okay. So that is uh, Romans chapter 16. So basically he's saying to be of one mind, you know, be in unity and oneness. And as you do that, you know, uh, God of peace will crush Satan. And then God who called you will enable you and strengthen you. Even as this God is a God of wisdom who does things and would uh, bring glory to uh, uh, in glory in everything that he reveals. And even as he in, goes about initiating his plan and uh, uh, purposes in our life and in our time and generation. Any questions? Uh, Pastor, just yes. one question. Yes. Um, the one thing we mentioned today regarding God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath our feet. So does that mean that Satan is not under our feet right now? Or could you explain the uh, shortly that word one more time? Because is it after the coming of our Lord Jesus or how is it? Yes. A uh, good question. Thank you, John Paul. Yes, on the cross, we know that Jesus uh, disarmed the principalities and powers, which means uh, our enemy is uh, is disarmed. He is nullified. Has no. He's rendered as powerless. Uh, he has uh, no uh, power. But then, of course, the enemy is still there, right? He still goes about and, you know, he engages in, in, in guerrilla war tactics. Basically, what is his war tactic is he knows that he's disarmed. He is, uh, he is powerless. He's, uh, he has no, um, uh, uh, he has no power left because he's basically rendered nullified in his power. But then what does he use against us? Fear tactics. Okay. Uh, we are we are living in fear that oh this is the enemy that's doing this this Satan and we think that he is powerful enough when he is already rendered as his powers are nullified he is rendered as uh, powerless uh, but he he goes about you know uh, instilling fear in us and our you know what fear does you know to each one of us you know it um, it brings us to a point of a standstill it brings us to a point where we don't uh, trust in god in his uh, in his promises in his word and uh, can hinder us and stop us from pursuing god's plan and vision and satan has accomplished what his what he wants to do even as he has instilled this fear but um, we'll uh, hear also that you know uh, it also reminds us that yes even as satan goes about doing these like gorilla war tactics it's important for us to be mindful of who he is his position and where he is and what is our position that we are um, you know seated at the right hand of god and we have in a place of authority where we have authority we have authority over the forces of darkness and dominion uh, in the uh, uh, in the evil realm and so it's important for us to know that as well and to exercise our authority uh, but it can also mean that you know yes there is a day when god has a day planned when um, uh, Satan will be thrown, you know, into the hell, uh, 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 into hell, uh, the lake of fire, uh, and he will have no more, you know, uh, uh, no more sway over our lives, no more, um, uh, you know, uh, ways that he can uh, uh, come and tempt us or, you know, lead us astray. So there is a day that is appointed for us, and even as that day has not yet come, so he's still you know, free to roam around and do what he's doing. Uh, it's important for us to know who he is, where we are. And also there will be a time when uh, he will, uh, you know, will totally be uh, uh, crushed and disarmed and uh, rendered, you know, as uh, as uh, uh, somebody who is has no more powers over mankind, uh, that day will come. But it's also important for us to know that even as we continue to do what and fulfill what God has called us to do and obey his word, that we can overcome the enemy. Because all of these people who are bringing in divisions and, um, uh, you know, causing uh, strife and offenses and leading the simple people, it's not the spirit of God, it's true. Uh, uh, demonic forces that is working in uh, them. So he says, and even as you keep this unity, you know, uh, 
you can overcome uh, Satan. You can overcome. So it's it's not talking about uh, uh, God overcoming Satan, but it's talking here about us, you know, gaining uh, victory uh, over him. It's us. Um, like I said, it's 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 us walking in dominion and walking in the experiential triumph that Christ has given to us. So we need to be mindful of the victory that we have and the dominion that we have received and we will walk in that. That did that help, uh, John? Um, yes, boss. Yeah, thank you. Okay, that was a good question. Anyone else? Anyone else has any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, then uh, we'll finish our study on the Book of Romans. I hope you all enjoyed um, uh, this uh, study. It's quite a profound uh, book with quite a lot of uh, deep uh, insights, theological insights and learnings and uh, uh, please read through it, uh, listen to the lectures again if you want and uh, you know just walk in uh, in everything that we have learned and gained insights of these revelations and the truth uh, from what the Holy Spirit has revealed to Apostle Paul to the church at uh, Rome. Okay. And may the God of grace and peace be with all of you. Uh, I'll see you next semester. Um, uh, teach you another, uh, I think, three books from uh, the New Testament. Um, but even as we end class, thank you all. If you have any feedback, uh, uh, please share the feedback. I know you've shared your feedback about the assessments. I tried to give you some more time for the assessments. Um, and yes, if you have any feedback on the Book of Romans, please do share it. It will help me as uh, to teach it when I do it next time. It's a good learning experience for me as well to just go back to some of these truths, just reiterate these truths um, and to be encouraged and strengthened in my walk and journey uh, with the Lord. I hope it's encouraged you all as well. And uh, yes, have a blessed Christmas season, all of you. Uh, so our our uh, in-person students will go home. So happy holidays for all of you. and. Also to all of you online students and e-learning students, have a blessed Christmas season and I'll uh, see you in the new year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Zelatoli. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, John Paul.